What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to the Scene Snobs Podcast. I am your host, Mick Manhattan, the Scene Snob himself. And uh, we're back again. It's actually a pretty quick turnaround on this episode. Because if you remember, I was sick last weekend. Well, last week, I should say. And I kind of delayed the episode and it didn't come out until last Saturday. So now it's Wednesday and I'm turning around and uh, not much has been going on. But we did get some very cool trailers. And I kind of wanted to go over a few things that I've been reading about. Some things that have just interested me going on in the entertainment world. Um, So we got... uh, I did want to talk about the Morbius trailer, which I, did, I wanted to talk about in the last episode, but I kind of ran out of time, and um, I kind of wanted to give my reactions on it because I was so excited about it. Um, I Morbius was always a cool character in the comics for me. Um, I didn't read Blade comics, but I always liked when Blade would show up or Mo, Mo, Morbius would show up in Spider-Man. Um, you know, initially... Uh, he, he was a very cool, different type of character, and I like the fact that, you know, he was a living vampire, but, like, you know, when he would show up on Spider-Man, it was so different. It was a different type of rogue in his rogues gallery. So, Morbius showing up was, uh, in a weird way, ironically, a breath of fresh air, because he didn't have a lot of supernatural. You know, even though Peter Parker seemed to always be dealing with, like, interdimensional things and stuff like that, like... It always seemed to be explained by science, and so is Morbius, so I can't really uh, say much to that effect, but um, there was a supernatural element to it, of course. He's a a vampire. Um, Yeah, there may have been a scientific route to get there, but he was, in fact, a vampire, Um, and they played him up like a vampire, Uh, you know, the way he looked, everything else, so... um, but when I heard that they were doing a movie on Morbius, I got Jared Leto. Jared Leto's a great actor. Don't get me wrong. I, I like the fact that Matt Smith's in it. Uh, they got a lot of people to be in it. And it's connected with Spider-Man. You know, you see it right in the trailer. But uh, I, I wasn't excited when I first heard. Because I was just like, eh. Like, when you saw the Blade deleted scene back in the day, and you saw Morbius standing up on that ta- on the building, and like it was kind of like, oh, it's going to go off. And then you never came to fruition. We didn't get anything with it. That was sad. But, you know, we got, uh, now we're getting a movie. And I didn't think Morbius was enough of a character, a, a, a deep enough character to, to carry his own movie. So, when I heard the news, I was like, all you really have is Jared Leto. What is that going to do for you? Because especially after seeing the Venom movie, and I didn't hate Venom at all. Um, I thought they did a pretty good job with it. I just wasn't as excited about it because it wasn't really a tie-in. Yes, it's it's in the same world as Spider-Man, but they didn't really tie it in. And uh, and Venom's storyline, of course, is is highly tied into Spider-Man, and and I just thought they were it was a missed opportunity to do that. But whatever. but I just didn't, I didn't, I didn't love it. I didn't love Venom. And so when they were talking about Morbius and then, you know, starting to come to fruition, I was like, ah, I'd probably like Morbius even less. But I'll tell you, I saw that trailer and that trailer looks awesome. I'm really excited for it. I love his look. Um, I love that they're going with his backstory and they're, and they're going to play that up. And uh, I love that they brought Michael Keaton back into it. To kind of set up maybe a Sinister Six or however that plays out. Um, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Really interesting. Um, the fact that it's going to tie in more. Like where Venom didn't really tie into. It seems like they wanted to say, hey, he exists in the same world. But you're not going to hear anything about this. Um, I was kind of hoping that it would tie in with Spider-Man more. Um, and this seems to be giving us that that tie-in that we want you know he is one of the rogues so why not put him in there and uh i i I can't wait to see what happens so i am definitely on board for right now with that trailer i'm definitely on board with the movie i can't wait to see it um and even even going forward if there are things that lack around it uh i still i'm still kind of excited to see it it feels like a marvel movie but it feels like a darker marvel movie which is funny because if you think about it and DC, and I'm just going to adjust a little bit here. Sorry. I got my hand in the way there. Sorry about that. Just want to 
put a little less headroom on the spin on there. Um, so we have DC, and DC is trying hard. Um, I'm gonna kind of get into the DC TV world because I want to talk about Christ on Infinite Earths, but uh, that's gonna be more towards the, that's gonna close out. I just want to talk more about DC with, like, what I'm hearing about the movie now. I'm hearing they're going to do a just Dark Justice League movie. Um, which would be awesome. But they've screwed up so much that I doubt they'll get it right. And it's sad to hear. Um, especially since I, I haven't seen it, but I had heard that the first season of Swamp Thing was great. And they canned that. Before it even started, they, they canned it, supposedly. So, um, I'm kind of annoyed by this. Uh, so it seems like Marvel's going in that direction. That's like, oh, you're doing a Justice League Dark? Okay, we're, we're going to put Morbius. We're going to have Blade. We're going to have the, all these things that are the darker parts of the Marvel Universe. And I, I love it. I think they're going to hit the nail on the head. And I think DC's still going to be standing around kind of twiddling their thumbs. Um, but I don't want to... I don't want to harp too much on DC because I'll get to that in a little while. But um, we had some other trailers too, uh, some exciting ones. So we had the rhythm section with um, Blake Lively, which looks interesting. I don't know much about it, uh, and I just learned through the trailer what the rhythm section means. Um, so it looks kind of cool. Uh, it looks like she's family was murdered, and now she's out for revenge. Kind of looks like that in the line with... Um, Kind of like a Death Wish, uh, maybe not really Death Wish, Death Wish, with the exception of the remake, like if you think about the original, like he's just becomes a vigilante, he never really avenges anything. Um, he just is like, okay, you, you killed my wife, you raped my daughter, I'm going to murder everybody just for, just, for, just cause, and you never see Jeff Goldblum again. Um, so... This looks more like calculated and more, maybe more like born, uh, born movies type where she trains and, and she goes to kill, uh, become who she needs to be to kill the people who killed her family. Uh, it looks interesting. Uh, it actually looks more of an interesting take than the one that I think Jennifer Garner did peppermint. Um, that wasn't as good for me. I, I didn't really enjoy that as much. So hopefully, I, hopefully this one will be better. Uh, we got Horse Girl, which is Allison Brie. It, uh, I think it's a Netflix film. Um, uh, I, I don't, I don't know why. I think the end was in the corner, but uh, that's what I'm remembering. So it seems like she starts losing her touch with reality a bit, like in uh, you know Horse Girl. I it doesn't really explain much. It just seems like she day in day out, she's just kind of living life, but then she finds her finds weird things going on around her, but it's not supernatural. Uh, well, it might be. I mean, they don't really leave that open. Um, it just seems like maybe she's kind of losing her mind a little bit. So, um, but it's, and it's enough in the trailer for me to want to check it out. So, uh, go check out the trailer on that, Horse Girl. Uh, another Netflix movie, uh, Spencer Confidential. I'm kind of excited for this. It's Mark Wahlberg and Winston Duke. They are playing Spencer and Hawk. Now, if you don't know, for us older folk who grew up in a bar with even older men, um, we watched old TV shows and one of them was Spencer for Hire. So I grew up watching that and that was, uh, what was it Robert Ulrich, um, and, uh, Avery Brooks played Hawk in that. And basically it, he was a private investigator. They're both private investigators and they would go out and they would, uh, you know, Spencer was more the private investigator and, uh, Hawk was kind of like his, his muscle, his friend, um, and so they go out and they would solve mysteries. Well, this is the kind of the beginning of that. And Mark Wahlberg is playing Spencer. And uh, then you have uh, Winston Duke playing Hawk, which I'm excited for. I think it's going to be pretty cool. It looks good. Uh, other than Post Malone trying to look like he's in prison and he is there for anything else but getting beat up. Um, you know, but he's in the movie for, it seems like, a split second. Uh, but it looks interesting, and that's going to be a Netflix movie that comes out in March. Um, another movie, a new Patrick Stewart movie uh, named Coda. It looks like a drama. Uh, I thought it might be a thriller, but it looks like it's not. It looks like it's going to be a straight drama because it, 
it, I thought the trailer was going to go one way at one point. He's an old, uh, older pianist who lost his wife, I guess, a few years earlier. And he's kind of lost his way and kind of went into seclusion. And Katie Holmes plays a younger woman that he falls in love with. And um, she starts to inspire him. So that'll be interesting. Um, it looks pretty good, actually. Um, it looks endearing. Um, we got Alex Ryder, which is a new TV show on Netflix. It's, I guess it's based on a book series. Um, Alex Ryder is a teenage MI6, I guess. Uh, British secret agent. Uh, it looks... It doesn't look bad, but, I mean, I, I don't know that... I need, like, a a British agent Cody Banks TV show, which is what it kind of looks like. Uh, maybe not as hokey, but, um, and, you know, like, it will be more violent. It will be more suited towards, like, I guess, later teens or whatever. But I don't know. Um, I don't know anything about the books. Trailer looked kind of cool, but it also is very reminiscent of the old James Bond Jr. cartoon. Which, if you remember, was a cartoon very short-lived back in the 90s where James Bond's nephew, and I, so I don't know why he was James Bond Jr., um, would go out and he had all these gadgets and stuff and he would solve, you know, spy crimes, <laughs> I guess. Um, so we got some cool things coming up. Um, uh, we got Picard. Picard starts... Tomorrow. I was thinking next week. I don't know why I was thinking next week, but yes, tomorrow. I, I'm completely flabbergasted by that. Um, but very excited. Uh, I mean, he's back. Like, he was on The View today, and I thought it was beautiful because he's sitting there and he's talking with his old pal, Whoopi Goldberg, and he says that he and the creators of the show want to formally invite her to uh, bring her on for season two. So that we're going to get... Uh, Get Whoopi Goldberg back. She she accepted, so she's coming back to play Gina, and uh, it's exciting, man. Now, I should preface everything I say is like I've always been surrounded by very hardcore Star Trek fans. I really like Star Trek. I'm more of a Star Wars guy, but I love Star Trek. I love the Enterprise. Um, I have all of them in the Eagle Moss up there. Uh, I've always loved that ship. I've always thought it was the best ship. Um, Followed very closely by my favorite Millennium Falcon. My second favorite Millennium Falcon. Um, and I love the movies. So I was always more of a, I love these movies so much type of deal. Um, especially the original series movies. Um, and I've watched the original series. I've watched, I, as a kid I watched uh, Next Generation. Um... I did not watch Deep Space Nine as a kid. I, I was older when I just sat down and binged all of that. Um, now I've never seen Voyager. Um, and I have watched all of Ent Enterprise. I'm not against Voyager. I've just never gone back to go and binge that. Uh, it's probably time. I should probably go back and check it out. Again, I've always been more interested in the happenings on the Enterprise because I love that ship so much. So I think that's why I always, like I watched Enterprise when it was on TV. I watched Next Generation was on TV. I watched the original series, um, like in reruns when I was a kid. And, and I still do, I'll still put on episodes. Um, and Deep Space Nine I watched when I got older. And so I think Voyager's gonna be next. Um, now, I think the reason for that was Next Generation was just kind of my my introduction because it was on when I was a child. Like I was, what, it came on in 87. So, uh, I think it was 80, 86 or 87. And so I was about five or six. Um, and it was syndicated. So it was on like Saturdays at 7 p.m. And we watched it. It was just on. It was just one of those things like after the Saturday afternoon movie was over, there was nothing really on. You had Baywatch and then you had next generation until you got to eight o'clock which was all the prime time slots and we watched it every week i remember watching i remember me and my brothers we watched it we would joke around with each other about it because we didn't fully get get it um 
but I remember always being enamored by it. Like I wa I knew who Captain Kirk was, but I never, I never saw the two. I never married the two until later. Of course, I've watched everything again, and I love it. I love everything about it. And I give a lot of my friends a hard time about who the best captain is, and I'm always saying Kirk, Kirk, Kirk. And I love Kirk, and Kirk is great. Kirk is a kick in the door guy. Um, and I always, I can always appreciate that type of cavalier attitude, but I mean, let's, you know, hopefully they're not watching this episode, but, uh, of course it's Picard. Picard is the best captain in the history of Star Trek on screen. So, and I say that because he handled things beautifully. He trusted his people. He was a great leader. Um, just everything he did, he he calculated moves. Even when he was angry, like he he never had to retort resort to violence. I thought one of the one of my favorite things was with Q. He always dealt with Q, and how he would just always be annoyed. Like I don't have time for you, Q. Like Q could blink everybody out of existence. Uh, he was God. He was God, <laughs> and he was so interested in Picard. Because Picard just would not put up with his stuff. Picard was just like, I don't have time for you for this or for you. Leave me alone. And he'd still have to deal with them because Q's not letting him go that easily. But, like, he just, he always overcame. And I, I love that. I mean, he overcame be being the Borg. But um, one, of the, my, one of my favorite things, like, when you get to Deep Space Nine and Q shows up. And immediately Cisco punches him and knocks him down. He's like, Picard never did that. And he's like, I'm not Picard. Uh, and I always, I respected Cisco for that and many other reasons because I thought that show was great too. Um, but it was like, it does show like Cisco isn't Picard. Picard is a whole other level of leader. Um, but Cisco is doing the best he can and he acts on his reaction. So he has a little bit of Kirk and he has a little bit of Car Picard in him. And I always love that. Um, and, but I just always love how he handled Q and they showed it, you know, they showed a difference. Um, He's not even Riker would step out of line and punch Q. And if he did, Q would not put up with that. <laughs> you know? So, with that, I, I just, I'm really excited for this new show coming up. Um, I like, they showed a, they had a, released kind of a, a small um, part of the first episode, I guess. And he's being interviewed, it seems. I don't know whether it's like for a college class in Starfleet or something like that. Or, um, or, uh you know, or what it is really like, but he's being interviewed and they asked her like, you know, you were high command, such, um, you know, they ask about data. They ask if he ever doubted data and he said never once. Um, and then they were like, why'd you leave Starfleet? Like, you know, why you were high command, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, because it's not, and he like, he gets mad and he's like, it's not Starfleet. You know, it's not the Starfleet I know. And, that's what I'm most intrigued by with this new series. That's, see, that's what I was always intrigued by with this. I always kind of wanted to see how the world worked. They always told you, they said, you know, we don't use money. We don't, you know, and they always gave you snippets that made it more interesting. But to really see how the world that Star Trek takes place in work. And that what is Starfleet? What is this entity that we're supposed to just buy in that they're good? And not, and how is it going to change? How can it sustain itself? Can this utopia that uh, Gene Roddenberry gave us sustain throughout time? And I just, um, I'm interested to see what they do because obviously it doesn't. Obviously, there are things that are going wrong, and it's not the Starfleet that he remembers, so he walks away from it. And now he's got to put together a new crew that's not Starfleet at all. Like, you know, some of them are bandits and rogues and, and, and such and uh or outcasts and to see Picard pull them all together and have to captain again is gonna be real interesting and I'm excited for it. But how it all plays out and what kind of world is this now? What is Starfleet done? What is Starfleet doing? Um they have a lot of cool things. So uh I am a, I think they're going to give us more answers in of the world in this and I'm definitely looking forward to that. Um I do, like, I don't like politics in anything, but I do seem to like it in Star Trek and just the inner workings of how it all works. Because who doesn't want to live in a utopia, you know? But how, do, how does it go when it goes bad? 
So, I mean, I know it's topical and everything else this was going on in the world, and that's what they're trying to do. But I'm definitely excited to see where this goes. Um, and Patrick Stewart's back. And they br they're bringing most of the cast back, just even if it's for snippets. But I, I love it. I just love it. Um, now, with Picard, I think Star Trek is going to dominate again. Now, I was talking about my two favorite ships. Slow, not slowly, swiftly, I should say, coming up and, and taking the third slot is the Orville. Uh, I have fallen in love with that show. It's very reminiscent of, of Next Generation. Um, I, from the first episode watching the pilot, I was like, I bought in. It's made by Seth MacFarlane, who is A, a genius, and B, knows how to tell a tale, man. Like, he knows how to write a story. And when, when I was watching this, and, you know, as each passing episode just kept getting better and better and better, and now it's going to Hulu, and I think it's just going to get better from there. I'm super excited. Now, the reason I bring that up is because good on Seth, Seth MacFarlane just came out, has this big deal. So he was working with Fox for a long time. And he will still in the same capacity as he's going to be doing Yorville. He's going to still, he's going to see Family Guy until the end and, you know, American Dad till the end. But he is not making any new shows for Fox. He's actually going over to Universal. And, uh, yeah, whether it's going to be through NBC or he's going to do movies or, or whatever, um, you know, it, I think that remains to be seen. But I think it's like $200 million for seven years or something like that, maybe even five. Uh, sorry, I read the article the other day, and now I'm kind of drawing blanks on it. I should have written it down. Um, but I'm <laughs> just super excited. And I'm... Now, I brought up the Orville. I was talking about that, and I'm excited for him to come back and keep doing that and such because yeah, he's a great captain on that show, Captain Ed Mercer. He's terrific. Um, but I cannot wait to see what this guy does. And, oh, I'm sorry. I don't think it is movies because I think he's still free to go and do movies you know, however he wants, so he's just going to develop TV for them. But what's he going to do on NBC? What's he going to do on all these other shows? Like he's He's such a talented guy. I cannot wait. And I don't think they're going to be all animated shows or anything like that. Like, we've seen his range. We've seen what he can do. So, good on you, man. $200 million in your pocket. Happy to hear it. Good for you, buddy. Uh, I'm a big fan. So, with that, uh, before I get on to the, my, kind of my review of, I got a couple things I want to go over. Dr. Doolittle, just read it today, is on its way to losing a hundred million dollars for uh, the studio and and Universal to boot, which already just lost seventy million dollars on Cats, so they're not having such a great year. Um, so yeah, Doctor Doolittle. I don't know. It, none of it ever really appealed to me. My wife really was into the trailer. I just I was like, eh, I don't know. I don't know if I care. I, I don't. I don't even care about like either of the originals. I thought the one with Eddie Murphy was pretty good. It was Rex Harrison was the other one. Um, I just didn't... It wasn't for me, I guess. I, I just never really cared. I've seen them. But they never stood out. So, like, when I saw this, I was like, Oh, Robert Downey Jr., I like him. And I like a few of the people playing voices and stuff like that. But they never really gave you much about what, what's what. What are they going to do? What's the big adventure? And then eventually they show a dragon. And I was just kind of like, I'm out. I was like, all right, now it's dragons, and I get it. He can talk to animals, and only he can figure this out. So I just, I didn't care, and so I didn't go see it. I might go see it. I might see it when it comes out, but, like, it's one of those ones that's just, like, I didn't even care to go and review it, you know? Um, if somebody was paying me to go, I would go. <laughs> but uh, nobody was. So, like, But it is sad to see that Robert Downey Jr.'s first, like, movie outside of since he left Marvel uh, was to be a big flop. I wish he didn't go this route where it would have been Dr. Doolittle, but he always kind of beat his uh, different drum and, you know, he always kind of went for movies that were a little different. Like when Sherlock came out, it was a very different type of vibe. Uh, Sherlock Holmes, sorry. Um, 
you know, even when he did Iron Man, like, you know, he created this whole world, but it was just a different vibe. It was an off, offbeat character that nobody ever really read. So, uh, for him to try with Dr. Doolittle, I thought was probably cool, but like, I hear, you know, even with the story, like there's a lot of complaints on the story and it's like, they sacrificed too much with the story and, and made it silly. They, there was almost like they were just banking on him banking on, well, I mean, Robert Downey Jr. is in it, so he'll make a ton of money. And we all know how that goes. And now he's lost $100 million, and I wish his name wasn't attached to that, you know, when that's really the studio's fault. Um, so, with Dr. Doolittle, uh, my first review for tonight, I'm going to, I just watched it today. Uh, it just dropped today on uh, digital streaming, was the Jay and Silent Bob reboot. Now, I'm a big Kevin Smith fan. I love Kevin Smith as a person, as a uh, as a filmmaker back in the day, mostly. But, I mean, as of late, I didn't love everything. I didn't love Yoga Hosers. I didn't love Tusk. Um, I didn't... I was kind of, like, <laughs> I was kind of excited for Moose Jaws. That was the one out of that Canadian trilogy. I was like, that's the one I most want to see. And now I don't think he's ever going to do it because he's got so many other things going on. And I hope he keeps going on. I don't care if he does sequels. I'll see everything. I don't have to love it. I'll still go see it because I support him. Fellow Jersey guy. Uh, you know, it, it definitely, you know, something I will always go and check out. But watching the reboot today, it just kind of fell flat for me. Um, it felt like he just was trying to tell the same tale just a little bit differently from a father's perspective rather than a young man who wants to get laid's perspective. Uh, there were some cool, fun cameos that I thought were funny. There were some fun jokes. Don't get me wrong. He's going to have funny jokes in there that are smart. Uh, I thought Chris Jericho was probably my favorite cameo by far. Uh, Chris Helmsworth was pretty cool too. Uh, but there's a ton more. There was a really nice scene between he, Jason Mewes, and uh, and um, uh, Kevin Smith and Ben Affleck. Uh, they all where they kind of talk about uh, fatherhood, uh, parenthood, and such, and just kind of like how that changes you. And it was a cool little tie-in with chasing Amy that I thought was really nice. That was probably my favorite part of the movie, being a dad now, like, and understanding where he's going from. But I got that. You know, I wasn't a dad then, but I kind of got what he was going for in Jersey Girl with that. And that gets panned, and I don't think that that's that bad of a movie. You know, I thought it was a nice movie that just got panned too hard uh, because it it wasn't Kevin Smith being Kevin Smith. Um, but I overall, I think it's just a good movie. Um, but you also kind of get them reconnecting because we know that Ben Affleck and Kevin Smith haven't talked in so long. Uh, that them kind of reconnecting and, and doing it on screen and kind of playing it a little bit was, was pretty funny. Um, he does have his daughter in there. His daughter's pretty talented, you know. Again, I wasn't a big fan of Yoga Hosers, but she went in there and did her did her thing. Um, but she was good in, I mean, it was such a small part. Like, it was a small part where you didn't get to see her shine as much, you know, and which uh, is unfortunate for her because I do think she's a pretty talented actress. Uh, his daughter... Uh, Haley Quinn, uh, Harley Quinn, um, and she, you know, she's in the movie, she did just fine, uh, but I just, I don't know that I needed this movie, you know, um, it felt like they were taking Jay and Pop, Jay and Silent Pop Strike Back, which wasn't the best, ver best movie they, I bet, think they could have rebooted, I do like the fact that they acknowledged that Dogma's real within that universe, I thought that was cool, um, but they, overall, they just didn't, it just missed the mark, in my opinion. So, uh, I don't know that I would watch it again. Maybe. It just doesn't hold the same weight, like, with the jokes. Like, if I go back and watch Clerks, I'll always laugh. Chasing Amy, you know, I'll always love that movie and laugh. Even Dogma, you know, a lot of the older ones I will. But, like, this one just doesn't hold the same weight. Um, I, I just didn't feel it. So, I mean, check it out for yourselves. Uh, I suggest checking out, renting it, just to support Kevin Smith. I love the fact that when he gets behind the camera and he goes and does his thing. Again, it's a support thing. Uh, and some people might find, you know, find it better than I did. And, and that's cool. And I'm, I hope they do. You know, again, I, I want to support the guy. But uh, I just, for me, it fell flat a little bit. And 
Uh, I just kind of wish it wasn't uh, self-deprecating. Maybe that's not right, the right term. Um, it just felt like it was just jokes about his career over and over and over again. And I was just hoping that it would stop, you know, and just like kind of play out. You know, I don't need the jokes over and over and over again. I'm fine with the cameos. They're all shoehorned in. I'm fine with the uh, paying homage to your old jokes. One thing that was pretty sad was, the, <laughs> I took a picture of it, a red box outside of what used to be RST video. That hurt. That was like a dagger in the heart, but I got it. And, and you know, I definitely understood why. But it is what it is. Uh, but that, with that being said, that's that's how I felt about uh, Jan Saw Bob Reboot. So, just wish it was, it was a little better. I, I, I think... Like I said, I guess I think it w I wish it wasn't as big of a joke about his career as it was, because I think that took away from the movie. Um, then we have oh, I can't believe we're gonna talk about this. So I watched the first three episodes of Crisis on Infinite Earths, the TV events where all the DC TV shows and the DC movies are all gonna be tied in together as a multiverse coexisting thing that just just brought everything together that's what they were trying to do is just bring everything together and kind of condense everything down and that's how it started and it started off pretty good um i thought they did a good job with it you know they they introduced some things they introduced like back in december uh on a different show supergirl a uh, supergirl batwoman and flash's show um you know, they, they kill they wound up killing off uh the nineteen nineties John Wesley ship Flash. He was the one that sacrificed himself uh to um destroy the anti monitors uh like energy anti monitor cannon or whatever. Um and then you had uh you know, they went and visited a lot of people. You got to see Smallville kind of reemerge. John Cryer's uh, Lex Luthor was going around killing different Superman. So you got an homage to, um, the death of Superman it, kind of in a right way, you know, like it was, it was an image that was just like, oh, I wish the movie had done this. So, um, you got some cool things. You got Burt Ward, you know, a lot of these were ending, you got the birds of prey TV show, um, kind of played out and you got Dina Meyer. It was just her voice. And then Ashley Scott, who was played the huntress? She was running around. You saw her. Um, you just went back and you saw old. You saw Robert Wool. Robert Wool came out, and I know I talked about this in a couple episodes ago in the December episode, but just kind of retouch on it. So I was like, it started out all right. The first three episodes, I was like, all right, um, I'm in. I will accept that the paragons that they have put together. Uh, Instead of a super, well, instead of Batman, it's Batwoman as a paragon of uh, courage. You know, in all of these multiverses, and it's supposed to be a bat symbol that leads them to understand who the paragon is. But it's not Batman. It's Batwoman. Fine. Whatever. I understand they have a Batwoman TV show. I'm in. Just show me what you got. So, you go that route, and then you have... Uh, Supergirl is a paragon of hope, which you have Superman on the show. You have him on the show. And like Tyler Hoechlin plays him. He's on the show. He's on Supergirl. And he's not the paragon of hope. It's Supergirl is the paragon of hope. You visited multiple supermen who Smallville Tom Welling which I get they wrote his character in a way like spoiler they wrote his character in a way where he gave up his power so he didn't have him anymore I still don't know how that wouldn't make him hopeful you know uh but anyway fine whatever we'll, we'll play that off he doesn't have his power so he can't be a paragon even though there was a human being who was a paragon um whatever um they do pick a Superman to be a paragon of truth. Fine. I get it. And I'm, I'm on board with it. And it's Brendan Ralph, who is essentially 
Christopher Reeve because he was the continuation from the Christopher Reeve movie. So I get it. He's going to be the paragon of truth. He is the representation of Christopher Reeve. And then he gets blinked out of existence because Lex Luthor rewrote history in the Destiny book or whatever it was and made himself the paragon of truth. Whatever. Um, so now they come back after the break, which is the Christmas break, and uh, it's, they have, um, it's the seven paragons, all of existence is blinked out. Um, Flash is trying to run through the speed force. You find out that the speed force is in fact the, uh, cause Oliver Queen died in, in, the uh, first episode, I think the Supergirl episode. Um, and then he came back as Spectre. Cool. Whatever. You need a Spectre. He could be Spectre. Show's ending. It's fine. Uh, so he comes back as Spectre and now like he tells Barry, he's like, the speed force is the way to getting back the multiverse. What you have to do is go back to the beginning of time before the multiverse existed or, or whatever else it was and before the anti-monitor um, release the anti-monitor, uh, before the monitor released the anti-monitor. So they do all that. He goes, they go back, but he has to find everybody because now they're all stuck in the speed force and he has to find Oliver, uh, Spectre Oliver. Um, so he does that. He goes through and you kind of get like, he, he meets the flash in the movie, uh, Ezra Miller, uh, kind of run into each other and they talk and, it's kind of a fun little scene, a little buffer scene that just kind of like connects the movies to, connects those movies to the universes as well. So, I mean, that was cool to see, but, um, then you go forward and, uh, they go back and now it's in a quarry. They're in the beginning of time in a quarry. Uh, I don't know how that works out, but whatever. And they have to fight the phantom ghosts or whatever that, uh, Antimonitor brings with them. And so they're doing that. And Spectre is fighting Antimonitor. And it ends. It is such a... You know how if you read comic books, and this is for my comic fans who especially have read Civil War, and you see that panel, those two, that two-page panel, where it's Stark in his side... Captain America and his side, and they're lined up, and they're facing each other, ready to go, and it's this epic-looking panel of Civil War that's just intense and beautiful and amazing. And then you turn around, and we got Civil War, which was a good movie, and I enjoyed it. But it doesn't let that whole scene, when it's one running at the other, does not live up to that panel. It doesn't. Come on. We all know it's just the airport fight scene with like 10 people. Um, it is what it is. I accepted it because they didn't build it out as much and that's fine. And they did still did a good job. And they didn't try to make it bigger than it was. And they didn't even really try to play it up like this is so epic. You know, it was just like all right, this is a fight that's been culminating for years. And, and we were in. This was not that. And if you have ever read Crisis on Infinite Earths, it's got some even more epic um, panels. And this was not that. And so now you have uh, like the seven paragons all fighting um, these phantom beasts. I can't even remember the names. I was so annoyed by it. Uh, and then Spectre fighting Anti-Monitor. And then he just, he kind of low pins uh, the Anti-Monitor with his lights coming out of his eyes. Um, and everything ends and then they all wake up and they're back and they're back home and they all live on one world now. Whereas before they all lived on different multiverses, all different multiverses on different earths. Now Supergirl is on the same earth as the Flash. Uh, Batwoman is on the same earth as Flash and uh, Supergirl and everybody, Black Lightning is on the same earth, blah, 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 blah. So... What this essentially said, because the last episode is them kind of batting clean up on Legends of Tomorrow and just like saying, well, this is what the world is now. And I'm just, and kind of dealing with the fact that uh, Oliver Queen is still dead, which they dealt with five episodes ago, but whatever. Um, so they go through. 
And I want to say this was cool. We get to the end. And I wanted to say this was cool, but it kind of bugged me. They're all standing and they put Oliver's, uh, they put Oliver's outfit, his green arrow uniform or, or whatever costume in like a glass case and it's standing there and it's in an, um, there's like an arrow, uh, fire pit, you know, it's like an eternal fire pit and they light it up and like, it's just going to be in this warehouse and it's always going to be burned and that's memor, memor, uh, the remembrance of Ollie. So they do that and I'm just like, okay, fine. It's in a warehouse, whatever. Not a big deal. Seen the warehouse before, especially from other crossovers. And then they turn around and he's like, it's an old, it's an old Star Labs building. So like nobody will ever, nobody knows about it. It's, you know, whatever. I own it, blah, blah, blah. And that's the flash. That's because in this show, Barry Allen owns Star Labs now. So he goes back and he goes, I set this up and he reveals a table and it's got all the chairs around it with all their emblems on it. That's what they wanted to set up. That's what seven years in the making final crisis, uh, or not final crisis, crisis on infinite earth, this crossover, that's what this was. I don't know why they couldn't just set them all on the same earth. I don't know why we couldn't figure this out from the beginning. But it took you seven years to get to this point where your whole end goal was just shown in the last episode. You wanted to put them all on the same earth and build Justice League. Because when you pull out and you see the building, it's the Justice League's uh, um, building. Um, yeah. It just, it just fizzled. I'm sorry. I didn't care. And I was so mad because like you started off pretty good. And not great. You didn't start off perfect, but you start off pretty good. And I liked where it was going. But this whole thing was just dismal and boring, and I just didn't like it. And I, I thought it was a poor ending for um, Green Arrow, too. Especially, he's got like two more episodes left, so I don't know how that works, because he's dead. But uh, I'm sure they'll figure it out. I think they're going to do a um, Black Canary and... Uh, a Black Canary TV show, or I think it's going to be Green Arrow and the Black Canaries, or something like that. I, I don't know. But that's what we're getting. So, they're still going to build DC. We're still going to get crossovers. We're going to have the Justice League now. They're all on the same Earth. They never. They gave Brandon Rouse, Superman, a pretty cool send-off where, um, you know, he because he lost everybody, because it's that... The Joker actually, went, they kind of allude to the Joker killed Lois and Barry and everybody in the Daily Planet. So he wore the black and red Kingdom Come outfit. By the end of this, he's back to red and yellow. So it kind of gives you that he's back to the true Superman that we know and love. But they don't give... The last thing they kind of say to uh, Clark Kent from Smallville is like, Ah, oh, you're all going to die anyway. And then they do. And then you never see them again. I was like, at least give him a send-off. You know, like, no, that Clark Kent's just dead? All right. I don't know. I, I was just, the whole thing, there, there's a lot of things, like, they, they, you know, and they showed everybody. They went around, they showed the Titans, they showed um, the Doom Patrol, all the different shows and some of the movies and stuff. And, and you know, I want to say it's cool, but it just didn't grab me. And I just... I realized why I kind of got out of these shows. I was really into them in the beginning, and it's just like it just showed me even more reason why I'm out of them. Um, but yeah, that's that was Christ and Infinite Earths. It fell flat, and it was just kind of lame, honestly. And uh, it was kind of sad. It's kind of sad that you know on the night I'm talking about both, um, you know, both James on Bob uh, reboot and and Christ and Infinite Earths. Two things I love so much, and it's just like, just not a big fan. But what were you? Were you a big fan? Did you enjoy both of them? Uh, or anything else I talked about? Uh, I'd love to hear from you. So uh, that's the show, and uh, please give me a like and subscribe here at the Scene Snobs channel on uh, YouTube. Uh, also give me a follow on Instagram and Twitter um, at the Scene Snob. We have lots of shows. Go check out everything we've got. We've got tons of stuff coming up, too. Um, we're thescenesnobs.com. And we have all our shows on there, everything, links to everything. So go check it out and let us know what you think and reach out to us. So like I said, like and subscribe. Follow us at The Scene Snob on Instagram and Twitter. 
We're also on Facebook. That's where this all started. The whole thing started as written reviews on Facebook. And then it kind of grew from there and just kind of went on. So um, I would love for you guys to go check it out. Let me know what you think. I'd love to hear back. You can message me. If you have any special requests for reviews, whether it be old movies, old TV shows, whatever. We have a wrestling podcast. We do the same. Uh, we have Royal Rumble prediction video coming out this weekend for the 20 minute wrestling podcast. So, uh, let me know what you guys think and, uh, look forward to hearing from you and, uh, we'll talk to you soon. Take care.